Hello, everyone. Welcome to our BioP Bio session. I'm excited to do this session with you. We've got some pretty awesome questions coming up. And it is true, it's our last session today, but you know, comment in and, and show your support, and maybe we can roster some some movement on getting some more of these uh, going for um, probably after the college board has released their details on April 3rd is my guess, but we, yeah, we don't, I, I don't, I don't really quite know, but yeah, Isabella, we hear you, we hear you. And I know that you guys are all here um, cheering us on yesterday. So yeah, today is our last day, Lakshmi. And, um, and for now, <laughs> But I, I, beyond that, I don't have any more details as to whether we're going to be releasing more, but do check out our recordings um, and, and then, you know, comment in and, and we'll be watching, we'll be watching. So, yeah, so this is what I would suggest you do, team. You go and look up all the old previous AP Bio questions. I do recommend trying to filter out some of the um, exclusions that they introduced um, recently, because I do some, I noticed that some of the um, questions are, are are different like you know they test things in the previous in the past that they don't really test anymore but yeah please do um you know get that practice in do more short answer questions or here's another really good one cover the answer choices for multiple choice questions that's what i would do i would go to old exams but cover the answer and try to predict try to do that prediction and that's very similar, like type it out or write it out, sorry, write it out, um, but try to come up with a prediction to the answer rather than using the multiple choice questions. I think that would be so awesome as a good substitute for learning how to do the skills for free response questions. So make sure it's complete sentences, don't do bullets, um, things like that. So, um, are investigations a lab part of the exam material? That's a great question. You know, I'm not 100% sure. Nick might be able to address your question, Jason. Um, but uh, but yeah, we'll look into that. I, I believe the material, not the actual, it's being tested, but um, the knowledge you gain from going through that is, is what's tested. So like study design, um, things like that. No more multiple choice questions. And then, yeah, all we know is that they're free response and it's 45 minutes long. So what I chose to do is um, this session will be all free response questions. I'm going to get you to look at a stimulus and give me an answer, um, but, um, but we'll review a little bit of content and the content behind it as well so that you're not, you're not just like coming away with a correct answer. Um, and yeah, you can like flex your multiple, your, your free response skills and start constructing answer choices that are complete sentences rather than just identifying knowledge um, with the multiple choice. Yeah, um, I, I, I personally suspect that they will be like shorter, like short ones, not like those giant monster, like, you know, there's like two really long ones and a bunch of shorter ones. I suspect just given the, the length of time that we have, um, and, and the fact that they, you know, you still want a kind of a representative test um, that it would be more short answer and none of the, the giant ones, but honestly, it's just, it's just a guess. So I'm not really sure. Yeah. Okay. AP is all free response, Allison. You are correct. You're correct. Actually, I have a slide on that. Why don't we go see that? Ta-da, there we go. All the info is right here. Check out the College Board site for uh, more, more description, more details. <coughs> If you want, you know the College Board is offering live streams of um, the last 20% of classes that, so this would be for AP Bio would be unit seven and eight. That is not tested anymore, but you know, you should have a more comprehensive um, understanding of the material in AP Bio. So check out those streams. You can go learn from them on such awesome teachers over there as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. First one is usually easiest for me. Is it supposed to be easier? I'm not sure, Isabella. That's actually a good question. Um, I don't think they constructed on purpose to make the first one easier, but I would recommend for you to look for the ones that you can do earlier, right? Um, don't feel like you're bound to do them all in order. Feel free to skip ahead and find the question that you can do. Don't get stuck, right? So don't do the first question or the first stimulus just because it's their first. Um, feel free to move around and save the tougher ones for the end. And that way, you know, 45 minutes is not a lot of time. Um, so it's, you, you want to make sure that you're dividing your time pretty evenly and get the points that you can, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah, slide is right here. <laughs> Okay, so this is, it's the same slide that we did yesterday and honestly the day before. Okay, yeah. Oh, 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 right. I, I totally forgot to ask you. Oh my gosh, I did not share my slide, did I? <laughs> okay. This is purple. 
I totally forgot. I'm so sorry, team. Now tell me, do you see the purple? I refer to a bunch of stuff that you had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> now you should see the purple. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll just wait here. So here's the thing, Allison, even though it feels like you guys are a, and you are a special select set of students in an unusual circumstance, you are not alone. Everyone is in this situation. Everyone is in this situation. So they are going to do their best to make it fair for everyone, okay? Um, so I don't want you to feel like you're selected out. Yes, it is different from the previous years and, and, the, and the subsequent years, but you guys are all in this together. So they will work on making it fair, okay? Yay, purple. Okay, let's go. So this is this is a slide. Sorry, I apologize. This is a slide that we were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, feel free to peruse it, take a look at it later on. These are directly from the College Board um, website about the new changes coming up. More details will be released on April 3rd. So definitely check out the site on that day and you'll get more description of like the kind of questions that you're going to get on AP Bio. Okay. Okay. So are you guys all ready for your first set of questions? We've got, as usual, a stimulus and a free response question. I'm going to give you time to look through and work on it on your own. So feel free, grab your paper, have it handy so that you can write down things. And then what I would like for you to do is type in your responses, but do not hit enter. And then we're gonna go ahead and look at everyone's responses and compare our results together, okay? So instructions are clear. I'm gonna give you three minutes for the first stimulus. You're gonna type in your answers, but do not hit enter. And then we're going to take a look at the responses together. So I'll see you back in three minutes.
Okay, team, why don't you go ahead and throw in your answers. I'm going to fix it so that you can see the clock now. I apologize for that. So go ahead and throw in your answers to my prompt. Go. Okay, ooh, okay. Grace has got a really good response. And I, I wanna point out something kind of really important about the phrasing of this particular problem. Because I agree with your reasoning, Grace, but you gotta be careful about the words. So we got, we, got, we got not a consensus. And I love the discussion when we don't all agree with each other. I, I love this, okay. So, nice, nice. Okay, so here's, here's one thing to point out. Scientists conclude that cancer cells must, must is a really firm, strong word. That means that every single cancer cell has to have the same response, okay? Every single cancer cell has to have the same response. They have to stop produce, producing XS, XIST in order for you to have two active chromosomes. But, oh, see, Grace, you see it now, don't you? Tell me why that can't be true. Yeah, it must stop, must, every single one, every single one. See, Allison, same deal, most, you say, most, and I agree with that statement. You were correct. Most of them have that same response, but not all of them. And if the word must is there, it means 100% of the time, all of them have to follow around that. I know you do all have different answers. And this is why this is such a good question. This is just a good question. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's kind of break down. Okay. So I'm going to be completely honest. The reason why I picked this question, first of all, is because it discusses bar bodies. And like two days ago in our session, we were talking about meiosis and polar bodies. I totally mixed them up. And I call polar bodies bar bodies. They are not the same thing. You can, they're not synonymous. Bar bodies are the inactive X chromosome. Polar bodies are something, you know, leftover genetic info after, um, you know, oogenesis, the formation of X. So they're not the same thing. I just want to clarify that. Okay. So this particular one. Yeah, no, I'll talk about what the answer is, Matthew. Just one second. So we have um, a, a transcript that is important in X chromosome inactivation. And I think the prompt is pretty clear and you might know this from your content background. When you have two X's, one of them is gonna be inactive. You don't actually have both active X's. Um, and so you have XI, which is the one that is inactive and then XA, which is the active one. So if I take a look, my comparison, you guys all should be looking at the comparison first. So this is your comparison, your wild type, your normal cell line, there's nothing wrong with it. You will see that you have positive XIST expression. That should make sense. You should be inactivating one of those. And I have normal Xs. That means I have an XI and I have an XA, okay? Normal, so just one, so only one X active, okay? The other one is an XI and that is not working, okay? So if I take a look at this, and honestly don't get all like stuck in the acronyms and the cell lines, you just gotta look. The rest of these are all cancer lines. And these four have negative XIST. That means that I'm not going to suppress one of those Xs. And then this is almost like a, it's like a double negative. If I have a loss of an XI, so XI is in, inactive, loss of the inactive means all of a sudden that normally inactive one is now active. And so I now in these guys have two active X, okay? So that part agrees with what the scientist is saying, that you, in order for you to, if you stop producing XIST, you're gonna have two active chromosomes, but the bottom one is where your eye should draw. You notice that it's different, it has different results compared to the other cancer cell lines. And here we see that if you have XIST expression, I am inactivating the chromosome and I still get two active X, that means that the scientist's conclusion is wrong. So you have to disagree. The correct answer here is disagree because of the proof that we see with, it's disagree because of the proof with the MCF7 um, cell line, because that is XIST positive and you still have two active X chromosomes, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. 
You were not meant to understand the reason why you have inactive axes and axes. That's not anything that you need to know from content. You have to use the data to support your conclusions and pay careful attention to the wording in the question stem. Okay. It is all about the worrying grades. Yeah, you did a really good analysis, but you 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 didn't see the must. And so you had the correct reason. You're you're correct, but this is a hundred percent of the time. If you see the word must, it has to be true. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Well, I mean, here's the thing for on a, on a standardized test, it's pretty hard to have the most in there and then um, use that as a correct answer. So yeah, it'd be tough. It'd be tough to say. So Ananya, sorry, I don't understand how the lady has two active X's. Um, I feel like lady might have been a type of that's okay. <laughs> um, so what what the what the what the the data is telling us what the chromosome status is. Don't worry about like trying to translate what all of this means. Like, don't stress about that. I just want you to know that normal X's means there's only one active. If you have a loss of XI and a gain of XA, that means you have two active X chromosomes and you should not have that happen. Um, that's so specific with these cancer cell lines, but they're saying that it doesn't always have to do with this XIST expression. That is not the factor that is always causing the two active X chromosomes. Okay, it's not the effect of the two active X chromosomes, Flora. Oh, oh, this is a good point. So what is the cause that the, the scientist is, is predicting or like um, identifying? And then we'll talk about the effect, okay? What is the cause? What is the independent variable that we're kind of looking at in this, in this particular experiment? What do you think? And I'll talk about the, the points as well. So the cause has to do with identifying the presence of the XIST expression, right? Yeah, you got it. XIST is, is whether it's plus or minus, right, XIST. And then the effect is whether or not you have one X active, okay, or two X active. So what they're saying is it's not, it's not acting, asking about the cause of having one X or two X, it's asking about that is the effect, okay? So in terms of the rubric here, I'm gonna make it a, an educated guess for that. I would say that in order to get the full points, you have to say whether or not um, you agree or disagree, and then you have to support it with data from the prompt. So it's two parts, agree or disagree, because, and then you have to use MCF7 data in order to support why you think the scientist is wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Mia, exactly. Well done, well done. So just make sure that your answer choice has the cell line that you're using as your proof. Flora, see, this is, this is what the scientist is proposing. It's not asking you though, just to be clear, if you were interested in looking into this more, I, I highly encourage you to do so, but it's not asking about the effect of this on body, but the scientist is proposing, well, that might be what's linked to the cancer. Like having extra chromosome does kind of bad things to your body. So having two active X chromosomes is probably part of the hy scientist hypothesis that is leading to the cancer. Um, I would say you wouldn't get full points unless you used MCF7 specifically in the data to support your claim. Oh, I'm glad you get it, Matthew. Okay. Tough question. Tough question. I did kind of throw you right into the water in this one, but let's move on and take a look at our very next question. And so it's a pedigree one. So I'm going to give you, as per usual, three minutes to work through this question on your own. Type in your answers, but hold that enter until we're ready to all get going together. So three minutes here.
Okay, now go ahead and hit enter. Tell me what you think. And I apologize for the wording here. I didn't mean to amend this, but I didn't get a chance to. I meant specifically this one in the first generation. So the parents, both parents, I need proof for both parents here. Okay, it looks like, looks like most of us are saying that this is a hetero, both of the parents are heterozygotes. And in order to determine how this all works though, you also need to know that this is a dominant trait. Yeah, this is a dominant trait. And both of the parents are heterozygotes. So let's talk about the proof for this though. What are you looking for as a proof for, um, uh, autosomal dominance, I think. That's okay, Ananya. That's what we're going to do this together. And there we go. Flora's got it. You're looking for children that have both expression and not expression. So look at the, the, the three thing. Yeah, the condition is not recessive. It is actually, it's actually um, uh, dominant. What is the proof for recession? If you're looking for something that is a recessive trait, tell me what do you think? It's important to know the proofs. It's important to know the proofs. That way you're not having to do Punnett squares for every single one of these things. If you understand the proofs, then all you gotta do is look for the pattern and then you'd be set to go. What is the proof for recessive traits? Here, I've given you a really good hint because um, this is dominant for sure. So dominant has um, traits that show up in successive generations. Yeah, the kids are effective. Recessive, Aditi, exactly. Skips generations, Sadie, exactly. Yeah, well done, well done. So if you're seeing skipping of generation, that is recessive. If you see successive traits coming up in generation, that is likely going to be dominant. Yeah. So here's the thing. Um, I mean, it's possible, it's possible that this could be a sex-linked trait, but um, as long as you provide proof as to whether or not you are correct, then you will get the points, okay? So I chose to assume this one is gonna be an autosomal dominant, but if you're like, that must be an, an X-linked dominant trait, then as long as you provide the correct reason for it, you, you should be good to go, okay? Yeah, how do you know? You can't really ever prove um, an excellent trait. You can, you can say, this is why I think it is. And as long as, again, you come up with the correct reason, you should be okay. But what you're looking for is, um, is a predominance essentially of like males having the, the disorder and pretty much no females having it. That would be like a good set of, of like support for having an excellent trait. I know here we have like four people and three of them are males and one of them is females. So it's possible, but as long as you have that reason. How could this be excellent? That's why, and, and, and kept, so I'll, I'll show you why that's a feasible thing. So I'll do it twice, okay? So this is, this is gonna assume that I have an excellent trait. So we're gonna call that X, R, X. No, X, R, like that. And then we're gonna go um, X, R, Y. Okay, so that this would have to be the genotype for this to be true if this was, um, Actually, you know what, we wouldn't, if this was an X like dominant, yeah. Yeah, this would have to be true. This would be an X linked recessive, sorry. This would be X linked recessive for this genotype to, to work. And so if you did that cross, right? So XR, XR, and then XRY, then the progeny would be, you got obviously 50% females, right? And then all the females would be affected. And then this would be like this. Now here we actually kind of see a problem already because the female in the next generation is going to be um, not affected, doesn't have the trait, but our Punnett square shows that th that has to be true. So actually it cannot be excellent recessive. Yeah, this cannot be excellent recessive. So that's a good question, but the data does not support that. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with my original assumption here. I'm not gonna say it's excellent recessive. I'm gonna say for sure it's excellent. It's just dominant, autosomal dominant. So I'll show you what it looks like to show you that this is, there we go, to show you that this is dominant. So let's say this is, I'm gonna call um, big D, little d, okay? So if this is a dominant trait, this is 
I'm going to assume that they are both heterozygotes. I do the Punnett square, and you can see that 50%, no, 75% of them would be affected that has a trait and 25% of them wouldn't. So that matches essentially what we've got. So these guys would all have the trait. And so that would be like these guys. And then the little d, little d would be, be the homozygous recessive would be the female of the generation. So this is supported by the data. If one of these, if one of the parents was homozygous dominant, every single child would get the trait. And so it, it cannot be that any one parent is a homozygous dominant for the data to be supported by the pedigree. Autosomal just means, Min, that it is not X-linked. So it's like any other chromosome other than the X chromosome. That's what that means. Okay. Yeah, females have to be XX and males have to be XY. You are absolutely correct. Yeah, well done. Okay. So um, a proper written response here. So remember, you can't like, you know, you can't just uh, throw, throw like whatever you want here. <laughs> You can't just say, you know, what the heterozygotes, like they are just like heterozygotes, but you need full sentences. Um, this would be an example response if you're looking for one. Okay, so inheritance is autosomal dominant since you have an affected parent with an unaffected child. And the parents must be both heterozygotes because there's a child in the second generation that is not carrying the trait. If both of them were homozygous dominant or if one was homozygous dominant and the other one had heterozygotes, <laughs> then all children would have this trait. Yeah, it's a tough question, right? Pedigrees are like, honestly, it's just really all about the practice though. It's really all about the practice. Okay, let's move on to our next one. Yeah, so remember that Mia, it's not that, like you can still have the possibility if you have a, um, an affected parent and it is an unaffected, um, you know, if I'm talking about generation two, like you're referring to, you have the possibility of having children in the third generation that are not affected. Just because it's autosomal dominant doesn't mean that every single generation has to have it. Depends on, on you know, chance, honestly. Yeah, yeah, you know what? Great question, great question. So Alyssa, before I move on, actually that's a good point. Do you need to, do you need to identify if the trait is dominant or recessive? You have to know if it's dominant or recessive in order for you to get this question correct, to correctly identify that they're heterozygotes. You don't have to explain it. To be clear, all you need to do is say that they're heterozygotes, both of them, and then say, say why according to the pedigree. But for your own understanding, in order for you to come to the conclusion that they're heterozygotes, you have to know that this is a dominant trait, okay? At what point should you stop explaining? That's a, that's a good point. Um, as long as you can state the genotype here, that's one point, and then explain your reasoning from the pedigree, then you should be good. I did over explain a little bit in this expl explanation for comprehensiveness. Like I, I wanna make sure that you guys all understand, um, but your answer could be a little bit shorter because you don't have to be like covering all the bases like I did, okay? Nice, okay. So we have another question in the set um, and it's gonna, it's gonna ask kind of like what a lot of you are asking me about already. So it'll be a good one. So um, <laughs> I meant those numbers to actually show up in the other one, but it didn't. But in any case, um, go ahead and work on this one. I'll give you a minute and a half for this question. And again, just type in your responses, but hold the answer until we come back together.
Welcome back. Go ahead and throw in your answers. And I also really do appreciate how you guys follow directions. I know it's not necessarily easy to do um, this kind of lesson on YouTube streams, um, but I, I, I love the participation and the follow up questions and the fact that you guys are waiting for your responses. So nice. Let's go. Every one, you guys all pull, uh, you know, typing in are correct. Well done. Excellent job. So here's the thing. Would you get full points if you said 50%? Would that be full points? No, remember, it needs to be a complete sentence. So what I would do is because the word, the verb there determine means you do need to have like why you think this, make it a complete sentence. It, the child is going to be 50% affected because, and then provide the proof of that. Yeah, make sure you put some proofs in there. Um, so the reason why this kind of works the way it does is that you, so, first of all, you have to know that these guys are, so it's kind of linked with the first one. So you have to know that these guys are both heterozygotes. Why? Because then it helps eliminate the possibility for what this guy has to be. So the parent, so, Generation two, square two, like this guy, has to also be a heterozygote. Zygote, yeah. Has to be a heterozygote as well. So again, I'm gonna use, um, you know, big D, little d right here for this guy. And then, then this is obviously a homozygous recessive. So again, do the, do the cross, right? So like this. And that means that these guys, two out of four or 50% chance that the child in that third generation, another child there is going to then be affected. Now, what does the, the fact that these guys are not effective mean? Nothing. <laughs> Previous things, these are unlinked things. You know, having a different gender or a different trait is not affected by the fact that there are other siblings there that have a different trait, okay? So do not take into consideration when you are calculating probabilities like this, what is also happening in that generation has no bearing. Um, it is always going to be a 50-50 chance, especially in this situation, that you're gonna either get the trait or you're not, yeah. Um, so can you give it as a fraction as well? Yeah, fraction work. One out of two uh, chance that the child is going to be affected would totally work as well. Yeah, you do wanna make sure that you have an answer. So here, um, as before, I'm just gonna throw that in. Oh, no, no. <laughs> cool. That is not what I wanted to happen. There we go. Um, here would be a sample response in word form. So since gen one, one and one, two are heterozygous and two, two must also be a heterozygote. And then two, one is also homozygous recessive. Another child would have a 50% likelihood. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, some of you guys really know your pedigrees. I'm impressed. Well done, team. Well done. Okay, we're going to move on from pedigrees and we're going to take a look at um, another question here. This one's a cool one. Um, it's been a hot topic these days because the people who, who did a lot of research on this won the Nobel Prize this year. So science is cool and relevant. So um, just like before, I'm going to give you um, We'll, we'll say three and a half minutes for this one. This is kind of long. Um, and so, and it is an explained question. So three and a half minutes to work through this prompt on your own. Again, remember to type in your responses, but hold your answers until we come back together.
Okay, team. Let's talk about this. Let's say you're like, I have no idea what half of these words mean. Ariana, what does hypoxic mean? It actually kind of is given to you. It's defined as having 1% oxygen. So really, really low levels of oxygen. We need oxygen to survive clearly. So having that little amount of oxygen and then it compares it to normal, you could infer just based on, on that if you didn't know what hypoxic meant, that it's just low levels of oxygen. So Awesome job, I didn't even tell you, but I'm impressed. Go ahead and tell me what you think is going on. I love it. Sadie's got an ish, even if you're iffy, I think that's, it's well supported and it's true and it's like, it's exactly what I'm looking for. So let's think. Um, that's okay, Isabella. Isabella is fine. You know, we're doing awesome here. So we can see here that like, let's let's actually maybe go through the, the pathway that's being described here. We've got two things. These are transcription factors. Transcription factors are used to turn on and off genes. And they're specific because um, they're only there to promote angiogenesis. Angio meaning blood vessels, circulatory system. Genesis means to make. So it's, it's making more vascularization when you have low levels of oxygen. So it's specific for low levels of oxygen, that hypoxic condition. So we have two mutations, one for each of the subunits, and then we run an experiment so that we measure what's going on with these different mutations in two different conditions. So we're measuring the presence of angiogenesis. Always start with the wild type. Notice that wild type, we have um, trial one, we have two of the, we have HIF alpha, HIF alpha and beta, they're both wild type. Under hypoxic conditions, the so 1% option, you get angiogenesis. Good, okay. Under um, lots of oxygen, you don't get angiogenesis. Also makes sense. Like the data here should align with the information you learn about in the first paragraph. Now we've got a bunch of mutants. And so trial two and three kind of like mix and match. Um, and so you wanna focus on trial three. Trial three, you have okay HIF alpha, but you have a mutated beta. And so the difference is going to be specific to the beta mutation, right? So if you look at the difference, well, I have angiogenesis works as fine as it normally does in low oxygen conditions, but take a look at this. This is a big difference between the wild type and your um, mutant, right? All of a sudden I get angiogenesis when I mutate HIF beta, okay? All of a sudden I get angiogenesis when I mutate HIF beta. And so this question is asking really, why does it actually occur in both of these? Well, you just, you stick with this. You don't have to be fancy. Mutation of the HIF beta is essentially, you are then able to, to turn on angiogenesis. It's a transcription factor, even in the presence of high amounts. So it's essentially lost its method of regulation. It's gonna be always on essentially. So um, that's what I would, that's what I would say is, in terms of an answer for this one, that's the full explanation. Mutation of HIF beta seems to promote angiogenesis in normal oxygen conditions, whereas that normally doesn't happen when it's, when it's not mutated. It is likely causing it to turn on transcription, even if HIF alpha is not present. And that is a detail that comes from this first part. Like from all the way up here, it says that normally HIF alpha is degraded under, high, under normal oxygen conditions. And so essentially HIF alpha is kind of like the thing that only needs to be there when there's low oxygen. When you have high amounts of oxygen, like it doesn't, it doesn't get, it gets degraded, it doesn't go into the nucleus and it doesn't turn on the transcription. In high amounts of oxygen though, even without alpha around, because that's degraded, all of a sudden I'm able to turn it on. So essentially HIF beta is like a rogue. It's lost, it's like partner friend that tells them to hold back and not grow any more blood vessels and it's gonna just continue to grow regardless of the HIF alpha is present, okay? Helen, that makes me so happy. You guys are awesome. I appreciate it, I really do. It makes all the late nights worth it. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at the second part of this. And uh, notice there's some uh, question marks in here. So you need to do a prediction of whether or not you get angiogenesis, and then you wanna justify it. I will say that our explanation for part A will help a lot with um, this next answer. So I'm gonna give you a minute and a half for this next one.
Okay, is one sentence, uh, sentence one, a good enough explanation? Yeah, if you can have, um, you know, you obviously have to fill out the table. So, you know, what is your prediction for angiogenesis in their low oxygen, hypoxic and normal oxygen conditions? So you wanna make sure you fill that in. There'll be like a box of some sort of you know, plus or minus in there. And then you have to justify why you think the way it is, okay? So um, here, I think the key part of this is to recognize that HIF beta, when it is, um, when it is uh, mutated, is uncontrolled. So it's able to turn on transcription regardless of what's going on. So yeah, let me think, let me think. Ah, okay. So remember, this is mutated in both of these conditions. So remember, HIF beta, when it is mutated, is able to turn on angiogenesis regardless of whether or not HIF alpha is there. So the correct answer is actually going to be plus. It's going to be exactly the same as trial three, because regardless of whether alpha is there or not, whether it's mutated or not, it's going to have the same effect on angiogenesis. Okay? Correct. So you got to make sure that you have two parts of this. You have to say why it's you have angiogenesis for hypoxic conditions and why you have angiogenesis for the normal oxygen conditions. It has to be both in order for you to get the full points for this particular problem. So here's, um, yep, so let me just tweet that guy. So here we go. So you need to have an explanation for both parts of that uh, table and it has to be both positive in order for you to get the full points for, for prompt B. Okay. Okay. It is constitutionally active. If you were to use the word constitutionally active, that would be another really good, like, you know, fancy, not fancy, but like a really good scientific way of explaining what's going on with the HIF beta mutation. Well done. Why is it negative in trial two? Good point. Now that the questions never asked about that TH. Um, but what's going on with HIF alpha mutation is that all of a sudden it is um, it's mutated so that it's not going into the nucleus, right? That's that's my proposed theory as to what's going on. But in any case, mutation of HIF alpha is not able to then bind to HIF beta somehow. And then together, normally together, they need to be there in order for your transcription to occur for angiogenesis. Okay. Okay, so take a look at the explanation. What we're going to do again, um, because we only have really five minutes, um, is take a look at our next question. Okay, so um, more pedigree kind of inheritance stuff. So um, I'm going to give you just a minute for this one. This, this one should be fairly quick. So one minute to work on question one. Go ahead and throw in your answers, but hit hold the enter just for until we come back. Okay, so we have an X-linked recessive condition that is very a common one that comes up for hemophilia. Um, and we're looking for the, the probability that a second son will be a carrier. Um, okay, so go ahead and throw in your answers for, for this. So remember, carrier is an important word to pay attention to for the woman. And the fact that the man does not have a disease, I would highly recommend that you do a Punnett square to figure this out. 
Yaren's got it. Oh, look at that. A lot of us are saying things like 50% and 100%. Peter's also got it. So make sure that you are not just giving me the percentage, but you're putting in a sentence um, and to get the full points because you don't get any points for just a bullet point, okay? So I'll show you why it's not 50%. You gotta, you gotta pay attention to, to certain conditions here. It's the sun. Let me ask you this. For an X-linked recessive trait, can you have a carrier for a male? Yo, Ephraim, you got it. You got it. It is 0%. So I'll show you the proof. Um, so here, we're going to call this for hemophilia. And that means the other one is X, like regular X. So that's our mom. And the male does not have the disease. So if you do the punnet, right? So here's another female carrier and a, uh, and a homozygous dominant female. And then you have a male affected, and then you have a male unaffected, no carrier. So there's no such thing as a carrier for an X-linked recessive male, okay? Yeah, so here's the thing, don't guess. Like put the proof, you have paper for a reason, do the pundit square, don't guess for any of these and read carefully. The conditions of the questions will be all given. This is a solvable problem, but you have to very carefully read the question to make sure you have all the required information. Yeah, so yeah, exactly, Flora. Either the, the, the son is going to have the disease or they're not gonna be a carrier at all. They're not gonna be affected once whatsoever, okay? Yeah, yeah, so that's why, I mean, I've done enough <laughs> of these inheritance style problems. Every time I do one, there's like a phrasing or a word in there that's totally tripped me up. So I do these ones super, super carefully and slow, okay? Okay, it is no min. Yeah, so here's the thing. The female is not a, does not have hemophilia. Because when you see the word carrier, it means that um, they, they don't express the trait, but they carry the gene, they carry the allele. So one of their alleles is affected, the other one is not, but they don't express the phenotype. That's what a carrier actually means. Male is XY, Alexander, correct. Oh, good question. Kaylin, I totally threw that in to trip people up. It makes no difference that it's the second son or the first son. Remember my question a little bit earlier. It doesn't matter what happens with previous um, progeny. Um, everything is like, it's a chance based on that one individual, okay? Um, yeah, so X, X is female, X, Y are males, you got it. So here is my um, typed up explanation for this one. So why does that keep happening? Wow, <laughs> let's try this again. I also realized team that I might've given the wrong explanation a little bit earlier um, for the previous question, so. That's okay, it's all good. So there's a 0% chance that the son will be a carrier because in X-linked recessive traits, the male can only be affected or homozygous dominant, no phenotype, I got it, okay? Um, yeah, no, so you can't just have the diagram. So the, the, it, the college word is pretty clear. You can use diagrams to help you explain, but you cannot just have a diagram and just call that your answer. It has to be accompanied. The diagram could help you with your explanation, it's mostly just gonna help you understand it, but you cannot just have a diagram as an answer. It needs to be a complete sentence accompanied by every response for free answer question, okay? Um, yes, Susan, yeah, you only really wanna use X, Y's for males. Um, other than that, just use like, just letters. And honestly, guys, don't do stuff like this. <laughs> don't do, uh, hold on real quick. Don't do, uh, don't do like letters like this. <laughs> Nothing is more confusing when you pick two letters that don't, that look the same when they're capital and not. Yeah, so there you go. Um, awesome job, everyone. I'm, I'm so happy that we got to do these sessions. I got to know a lot of you really well. Um, and I do hope to see you in, in future things. Keep an eye out for, you know, some news from us as well as from the College Board. Um, and let us know in the comments. If you want more, tell us what you would like. And we'd be happy to kind of get working on that. Um, but other than that, have a great afternoon, everyone. Happy studying. Happy Friday. Um, and we'll hope to see you soon in a future session.